This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. I'm so much more comfortable collecting real estate than I am collecting other stuff. This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse. Unfortunately, Bill Hamill is not here this morning. He is at a Luke Wren Mastermind in Orlando, Florida. So I'm sure that he is learning a lot there and, and having some great networking experiences. But this morning, I interviewed Ken Gee of KRI Partners. And I've said this too many times, one of my favorite interviews, but this one was, again, I, I got a lot out of it. And I think everyone listening will as well. Ken has a really impressive career background. He's been doing this for 25 plus years. And he's his first investment, I think he said a 28 unit, which is very impressive on its own. He started as a CPA. So you, you know, he's a smart guy who's, who's putting all of that business knowledge into real estate now. And he's been syndicating deals for the last you know 17 plus years. And now he operates a, a fund. And I enjoyed hearing the difference between raising for a syndication and raising for a fund, because I personally raised for a syndication, but not a fund. So I like to learn the difference there. And he has a lot of good insights on on the market in general and how to get started in this industry and if it's even right for you. I think two of the best messages he shared were five points for renovating a property, which I need to go back and listen and write those down and try and implement them myself. There's a lot there. And then four points for vetting a sponsor. And both of those, I think we need to clip and, and make videos out of. I think he could have a book out of both of those points because there's a lot of good information there. And again, just an overall great interview. And I think there's a lot of takeaway from it. Here with Ken Gee this morning from KRI Partners. Really excited for this interview. Ken has a very impressive real estate investing career. Ken, let's get right into it. Tell us, how did you get into real estate, real estate investing, and in, in this whole world of being a real estate investor? Yeah, you know, it. it's a long, long time ago, like 25 years ago. It actually started, I bought my first apartment community thinking it was just going to be a retirement for, for me, right? I'd hold it forever. And then what happened, it's a really weird, kind of a dramatic story, but I was, uh, my daughter was super young, like she was just born, where uh, I was in the middle of the night. Uh, in my house doing her nightly feeding. I was working for Deloitte at the time. So uh, I was working as a CPA, working about 80 hours a week. So I really, really, really loved that nighttime feeding because it was just me, her, you know, in the rocking chair and nobody else was even awake. So it was really cool time. I really loved to, to do that. One night though, all of a sudden I started, I, I got really stressed out, right? I mean, I'm enjoying this time, literally really liking this time, look forward to it every night. But one night I just started thinking, man, wait a minute, wait a minute, man. I'm, I, I've got this family now. I'm working like a dog. I feel like I have a kind of a successful career. But when I think about my financial situation, I can't figure out how I'm going to put her to school, through school without a ton of student loans. I can't figure out how I'm going to give them what I really want to give them, right? Because I'm working 80 hours a week. It's, it's just, uh, I'm on a rat race and I'm not getting to where I wanted to go. So that kind of that kind of ruined that night for me. But what it did was it made me realize, wait a minute, I need to make some changes here. So the next morning I said, all right, I, I bought one property. I really need to change how I approach this real estate business. And so I did that. So I went to uh, apartment, you know, back then there were, there were not podcasts like this. There were not lots of places to learn how to do this. So I went to apartment association meetings, um, got to know the speakers network, you know, did all the the things that you would do to try to learn and absorb as much information as you can. I mean, it took me a while, cost me a lot of money and courses and things like that to do it. But over the, the following couple of years, I was able to get a total of three properties and I sold them. And that's when my life changed because when I sold them, I had half a million dollars sitting in my bank account. Right? So now I went from, you know, her and I just trying to figure out how am I going to provide for my family? And it really made me nervous to now I made this big change in my life. And all of a sudden now I have a half a million dollars in the bank. Holy Toledo, are you kidding me? Like this, there is no question in my mind that this is what I need to do. 
And that was going to be the way I was going to do all of those things that I wanted to do. You know, I'll be happy, you know, fast forward. My kids are now grown. I did put them through school without all the student loans. So that's super cool. You know, we're able to do the things that we want to do. So uh, that that's, you know, that's a little bit of a dramatic story, but that's really how it happened. That's how I got started. That's what made me kind of push through all the stress to get it, to get, get my first deal done, you know, my first real deal done and, uh, and get it started. Thank you for that story. That's, that's a great real life example of, of someone getting into real estate full time. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot I want to unpack from that first networking, even though it's changed what it looks like today compared to 25 years ago, I can't stress how important that is, whether it's hopping on these podcasts or going to your local meetups, that that's what's going to change your investing career. It sounds like that happened with you. It did. Also, it did. you mentioned your first purchase was an apartment community. How many units was that? Yeah, but my first one was 28 units. Wow. That's a pretty large first purchase for just getting into the business. Yeah. So what I did, so I I want you to think about what my life was like back then. I was working for Deloitte. I was a CPA. So if you've never worked for a CPA firm, you know, early on in your CPA career, you're out in the, you're out in the cubes, right? We called it the bullpen and you're working like a dog, literally like a dog. And so I thought, okay, I needed, I, you know, I want to do this. How does a single, a double, a, a fourplex, how does that work? And the thing that I kept coming back to was I can't figure out how to run that like a business. I feel like I'm going to be over there trying to fix things. I'm going to be over there trying to lease a, an apartment. And and then I thought, well, wait a minute. If all of a sudden the roof goes bad, whammo, there goes all the profits I ever hoped to get out of this thing. Just gone in an instant. Right. So I, then I, you know, obviously buying 100 or 200 units just seemed ridiculous. I mean, that's no way was I going to be able to do that. So what I what I settled on, believe it or not, was a property that was small enough that I could find a way to do it. So I borrowed on my, uh, I borrowed half the down payment on my home equity line and talked my in laws into get, going in with me on the other half. So that's how we put the down payment together. The seller took back a note, and then I was able to get a property that was large enough to let me have a part time person live on that property so she could show the units she could help let the maintenance guy in to fix things and stuff like that so i could kind of run it as a business because remember i was working 80 hours a week at deloitte so that it kind of forced me into that size and that's kind of how it happened as i thought through that process that's great to, to scale you have to think of it as a business and not many investors do right away Right. But if you go into it with that mentality, you're, you're going to have a much smoother path along along your journey. I, I love, I'm fascinated by what inspires people to get started with real estate. And you told us what took you from that big four accounting role into a full-time real estate investor and more involved. What, what was the first thing that got you interested in investing at all in that first complex where you're looking at two fours, 28s? while still working that full-time plus job. Yeah. So uh, what got me into the first deal was my my brother-in-law and I, at the time we thought, Hey, let's, you know, everybody, you know, everybody thinks real estate's a good thing back then. Right. And so, Hey, it would be a great idea. We could buy this apartment complex together. And, and, you know, we were hoping for the mortgage to pay down and then we sell it, you know, 10 or 15 years later. And, you know, it would provide, you know, part of our retirement. I mean, that's what it was originally intended to do. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't until that aha moment I had with my daughter in, in her room that night that I thought, wait a minute, I, I need to do this more. I need to, I need to do this with more purpose, with, with be more deliberate about it. And so when I was at Deloitte, uh, I spent seven years there. That practice, the Cleveland office of Deloitte had a massive real estate practice. You know, Dick Jacobs, Zaremba, Developers Diversified. I mean, just all the big names. They all started in Cleveland and they just made a killing. When I was working for the bank as a commercial lender, I spent five years as a commercial lender. And so all of our all of my customers, they all owned real estate. And I could see they were making a lot of money in real estate. So, you know, it just seemed like I, I need to do this. I, I everybody around me is doing it and doing very well. And the only thing that's stopping me from doing it is, well, me. So that's, I mean, it's, but the the challenge that people face when they're getting into this business is it's super stressful. There's a, I mean, it, it takes a lot of 
not self-discipline, although it needs that. It just takes a lot of kahunas to just push through the stress because I can remember, I tell the story all the time. When I signed on that mortgage, I, I had everything I owned at risk, my house, my car, my, everything. I had a family. It was super stressful. And I felt like I had a golf ball in my throat. I mean, that's how stressed out I was. I mean, that was just really stressful. But you push through it nonetheless. You see, that's the hard part. Once you get that first deal done, then the second and the third, they actually do get easier. Uh, they probably shouldn't get easier, but they do. You, you just get less stressed out about them. So that's kind of how it evolved over time. I don't know if that really answered your question. but That's, that's an awesome answer. I, I think that golf ball in the throat is the biggest barrier to entry into it this is. commercial real estate investing. Being able And that's to why you need a network. That's why exactly. people that are just getting started need to network because, you know, we help people all the time. They just need that backstop. They need someone to say, I've looked at this deal. I think you're going to be okay, right? By someone with experience. On my first deal, I paid an attorney 3000 bucks to be that um, blesser. I don't know what you want to call him, right? That mentor. He, he didn't really do much. I'm, now I'm convinced he did nothing, but he gave me that confidence to say, oh, you know, a guy that owns 2,000 units, he said that this is going to work. So guess what? I'm going to go, right? I'm gonna and, go and there are right certain there. aspects of the transactions that they can help you technically with on certain, oh, sure. you, use this material, do this to the contract. But as you're describing, mm -hmm. the mentality behind it is just as important. Yeah, that $15,000 mortgage, you'll, you'll be able to pay that. The numbers work on this. It's, it's not, it's scary, but it's going to work out. Yeah. Yeah, now now our mortgages are two hundred and forty thousand dollars. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> crazy numbers. And and it doesn't get less scary because you're scaling up the whole. Every, every transaction gets bigger and bigger, and it, it stays intimidating. And that's what's so great about it. Yes, it, it is. It is fun. I won't lie to you. It is a lot of fun building what we build. What's even more fun is when we write our investors huge checks. That's more fun because Absolutely. you know they're super excited to get those checks. Of course. After doing it for a few years, I can't imagine doing anything else. You, you sold right. those three properties. You had half a million in the bank account. You're, you're seeing this new life in front of you. What happened next? I just started. I kept going. Um, act, actually, I, I did. So I did two things at the same time. This is a crazy story. But I decided uh, I, I was uh, I'm a pilot as well. I don't fly now. But I want, while I was at Deloitte, one of the other things that I was doing on my lunch hour was getting my pilot's license. So uh, the the downtown Deloitte office is a mile from Burke Lakefront Airport. So I would go down at lunch and uh, go fly my go, you know, do my flight lesson and so on. Well, after a while, I realized, you know what, people really this might be a business I could run as well as own, you know, run this real estate business. So I bought a, a Cessna Pilot Center. We ended up growing it to three Cessna Pilot Centers and about 20 brand new planes. And while we were also doing uh, the real estate thing. So that helped me. Um, you know, I definitely felt like I was comfortable leaving uh, the Deloitte. I left Deloitte as a tax manager to those two careers. The, the flight school stuff ended up only lasting three years. I mean, we grew it quite well and did very well with it. But three years, I just couldn't control the risk. So three years later, I said, you know what? No, I need to 100% focus on real estate, not just part time on real estate. And that's what we've done ever since. That's a new one for this podcast. You were collecting real estate and collecting airplanes. <laughs> Two <Yeah>. collections. <laughs> yeah. That, that, to add a little more stress to the equation, I bought the thing in May of 01. What happened in September of 01? 9-11. Mm -hmm. Taught me Very a lot stressful. about how to run a decentralized business in a really tough time. I will, I will definitely assure you of that. Yeah. Well, the namesake for the podcast is when I first started working with Bill – we were talking one morning and we had a camera on because he was teaching me a lot about real estate. And we were talking about collecting baseball cards and collecting other assets. And he said, I don't feel comfortable collecting anything as much as I do real estate. I, I Collecting real estate is the only thing I want to collect. And that shows another real life example of you're collecting multiple different types of assets and you ended up going yeah. with real estate for a number of reasons. Yep. yep. So was, was yep. your accounting background your key role as you were building this real estate portfolio is because I'm sure you were, had team members and you're building this team with this portfolio was accounting your, your bucket, as we say that you would fill your responsibility. Yeah. So <clears throat> I did have a financial background being a commercial lender, a CPA. Um, 
you know, most people that get into this business, they come up the trades side, right? They're a plumber, they're a handyman. You know, they could go to the property and fix a toilet. Well, I can't. In fact, I tried one day to go to my property. This is a ridiculous story. But I, you know, I said, oh, Mr. Maintenance Guy, I'll do this. I don't remember. His name was uh, I can't, uh, Al, I think. I said, Al, I got this, right? I was going to install a 12 by 12 cell stick vinyl floor in a kitchen in one of my apartments, right? This was a long time ago. Eight hours later, he comes in. He's like, what are you doing still here? And I wasn't even done yet. He threw me out. He's like, get out of here. You're, 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 you're clueless. Well, that made that that's a true story, me on the maintenance side. Now, I can figure out maintenance problems. I just can't. I don't have the skills to work with my hands to do all the things. He would put a floor in in two hours, in eight hours. I still wasn't done. So it became obvious to me that I needed to stay on the number side and the financial side because that was where my expertise lied. Now, someone else might come up on, you know, on the maintenance side. So then you bring into your team someone who understands the numbers. Because the reality of this business is the numbers matter. I mean, it's all about numbers. In the end, you're you're spending money, you're investing money, and you're hoping to get out money at the end. And that all has to do with value and numbers and cash flow and all that kind of stuff. So I always encourage people, learn as much as you can about numbers and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the real estate side matters a lot, but the numbers really do matter because then it gives you less stress as your moving forward with the transaction because you know you're going to go as your partner is the lender and the lender's only looking at numbers right they're looking at some reports on the real estate side so anyway yes to answer your question numbers was they they were my focus um and by buying properties that were large enough i knew i could hire out the skills uh that i needed that from the maintenance guys Ken, I can certainly relate to that. I had a finance degree and a sales background, and I cannot install a new floor. And I think of it as a blessing because I don't spend my time doing that. We work on new acquisitions in the bigger mm-hmm. picture, and we find talent that can replace those those needs. So fast forwarding to today, what does your, your day-to-day look like? What does your portfolio look like? Yeah, great question. So uh, as time went on, you know, initially it was mostly my own money. Uh, we didn't go outside to start raising money from people we didn't know. Uh, until, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, 16 years ago. So, you know, I, I did it for a while on my own and we started syndicating. That's what most people do in this business. So uh, they, you know, you'll put some of your own money in, you'll raise money and you go, you know, you'll you use it to fund the deals. And then uh, about 15 years ago, we decided we had had enough of the Cleveland market. It, we could make money in Cleveland, but it's really hard. And so we, 15 years ago, I decided we need to go to a different market um, I decided Florida was the market we wanted to focus on because it's growth. It's a growth market. So we syndicated a few deals in Florida. The challenge in Florida, though, is getting a deal because everybody wants to buy in Florida and everybody's a syndicator. So uh, we were, although we were a, a strong syndicator, we were still another syndicator. So when we brought our offer to the seller, they knew that there was this equity raise risk. So a couple of years ago, we flipped over to a fund model. So a fund model, the syndicators find the deal, then raise the money. In a fund, we flip that around. So we raise the money, and that's what we're doing right now. On our, We're raising another fund right now that'll be about $15 million. And when we get those commitments nailed down, we will then go to the broker community and uh, the sellers and say, look, we have the money raised. There's no equity raise risk here. We want to buy your property. And we now become a massively stronger buyer is huge. And so we've done it with, uh, we did it with our first fund and exactly what we thought would happen did in fact happen. And we were able to deploy the capital in that fund in seven or eight months in uh, three deals, uh, one in Tallahassee, one in Daytona, one in Bradenton. So good diversity. I mean, I couldn't paint a better diversified picture uh, in terms of markets and building type and building size. And now we're doing the same thing with our, with our second fund. So that's how we've evolved as a buyer and as a firm. A lot of great points there. I, I'm very familiar with the Florida market, Bill has syndications all over the St. Pete area, and I do short terms in Tampa. So I, I know the places you're talking about and the uh, different conversations that you're having with these brokers and sellers. But first, did you say you, your first syndication down there was 15 years ago? 
my first syndication was 15 years ago. My first syndication down there was seven or eight years ago. I don't remember exactly okay. when we bought it. Okay. I'm just looking at the timing here. If that, was, if that was 15 years ago, that would have been around 07. Florida syndication would have been an interesting story. But it sounds like yeah, after no. that. So, yeah. So what happened, uh, we did our first syndication in Cleveland. I think it was 04, 05. If our whole entire track record is on Veravest. If you've ever been to Veravest, it's right there. You can see our whole track record. They've verified most of it. Um, they're back. I think they went back 16 years. So it's wow, pretty I well heard verified. Of them. I'll take a look. Yeah, do because it, I mean, it's, you know, when you're raising money and you're talking to potential investors, you know, you, you want them to know that the, the, the numbers that we say we've done, that we've really done them. And that's what Veravest does. They go and audit all that stuff. So when you see our track record on Veravest, you know it's a real deal. I'm not making numbers up. So um, so the first deal that we did was in Cleveland and we were trying to buy early on in Florida, but we just, what was happening in Florida at the time was the big condo conversion craze. So people were, were, were paying for stuff that made no sense as an apartment complex. It was 100% predicated on their ability to flip that into a condo conversion put, you know, super nice finishes in the apartment and sell it as a condo. Well, obviously that didn't go well for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's, I, I don't know that we could take a whole podcast and talk about what went wrong in 07 and 08 because I watched it very carefully. So we never actually secured an asset back then. Um, and then unfortunately in 07, I ended up going through a divorce. So that took me out of the, uh, out of the, you know, picture for a few years. Um, but then when we came back, we came back strong in Florida and I've been there ever since. So what was that 07, 08 time like for your syndications in Ohio? We just did one. And so uh, remember, the divorce hit at end of 07. So you, you don't buy assets when you're in the middle of a divorce. It's just not something you should ever do. First of all, don't ever get divorced, all right? Anybody listening, avoid it at all costs. It's the worst experience of my life. And But I had two kids. Obviously, I love them very much. And I wanted to make sure that everything was going to be okay for them. They were young, you know, eight, six, eight, ten. I don't remember exactly. But so I committed an enormous amount of time and energy to making sure that everything was fine for them. So I didn't do much then. We did a lot of third party management then. It's kind of how we kept the lights on. I think we managed, you know, a couple thousand units easily during that time. But th financially, that was a difficult time. I mean, oil, oil prices were high, natural gas prices were high. You know, the economy tanked, the credit markets froze. I mean, there, there was, it was a perfect storm to, to be sure. But I will tell you that I learned so many lessons through that process. I mean, we, we never have given a, a building back to the bank. We've never had a capital call uh, on any of our deals. And it's those tough times that teach you what can go wrong that, you know, somebody that's only been in the business five years that, you know, they just don't even realize and understand that it happened. Right. And it's not their fault. It's just maybe they weren't even alive back then in some cases. Right. So absolutely. Um, or they were young. Right. They were yeah. young. They just, you know, they're not in a position to experience it. So, you know, when I I'm a big proponent of making sure that whoever you invest with, make sure they have experience and a track record. And it's for that reason. Right. You don't know what's coming. These are businesses that we're running. And you don't know what's coming around the corner. You just don't. And you want to you want to have an experienced management team that you've invested with, right? I.e. the sponsor. You want you want them to have the experience necessary to try to make really good decisions. I mean, you know, we're in, we're in an inflationary environment now. OK, should that make us nervous? Should it not? You know, prior to that, we we're in a pandemic. You know, there see all kinds of new issues that all management teams are going to have to deal with. Doesn't matter what kind of business you're running. You just, you know, you're going to have these kinds of issues. Um, I stick to multifamily because, I, you know, I can't figure out a way to make that go away. I, I, I just can't figure out how we're not going to need a place to live, right? I love that. I say that every day. Yeah. I mean, they, if, if we don't need a place to live, the last thing we need to worry about is our investments. Absolutely. Because <laughs> that means exactly. we are gone. We yep. don't exist. It keeps it simple too. focusing on just multifamily. You know what you're looking for. Being able to ride out a storm like 08 certainly gives you a different lens as, as you're investing now. I was only 12, 13 years old when that was going on. Yeah. And I, I, I know I'm going to have a lens like that when I go through an event like that in the future. And you, you're going to be thankful when it happens, but you're also not looking forward to it because you know it means hard times. 
what else do you look for when you're vetting sponsors? Yeah, what what I I want I, I've got four rules that I want people to follow. The first thing is I want to make I want them to make sure that your sponsor has experience. The second thing is I want them to make sure that the sponsor has a track record, right? I talked about the Veravest thing, right? Go there and look. I mean, it's most people don't like to really open the hood like that. They just don't like to do that. The next thing you want is transparency. Um, you know, you want your sponsors to be um, to make sure that that you want them to make sure that they're available if you have questions. You want them to communicate and send to you regularly, you know, balance sheet, P&L, uh, rent roll. And, and we do every quarter, we send out a narrative. We do it more often than that, but a narrative. What's going on at each property? What are we doing on the renovation side? Where's our project at? You know, what's our occupancy? What's, you know, whatever's going on on, on the ground, we want to talk to them about. And uh, the last thing is, I want you to make sure that you look, if you're going to passively invest, I want you to look at the terms that the sponsor is offering and make sure they're putting the investor first. Because there's so many ways. You, when you do this syndication thing and this fun thing, there are no rules about how you set up your terms, you know, and who gets paid when and all that stuff. There's no rules. You literally start with a blank sheet. And so, when we formulate our processes, for example, in our funds, in our syndications, you get your, your, all your money back, your preferred return, and only then do we get to our 80-20 split. It's backloaded, right? Investors come first. That's kind of the thing that I want people to think about. I want them to look at the fee structure similarly, just to make sure that the fees aren't absorbent. I mean, you got to have fees because it takes a lot of resources to do what we do. Trust me, we're not in it for the fees. We're in this for the performance-based bonus, that 20% at the end. That's why we're in business, because that's where we make money, and we only make money if our investors make money. So those are the four things I want people to follow. That sounds like a book. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> yes. No, those are great points. Yeah. I, I want to follow that up with, I'm under contract on my second syndication as a sponsor. I'm a 26-year-old. I'm, I'm fairly new to this. What would you suggest to other investors, other sponsors, other operators who are trying to sponsor their first deal, maybe their second deal, and they're trying to attract passive investors and they don't have that track record yet? They, they don't have that Veravest account that they can share with these investors, but they're very confident with their abilities to, to transition and operate this asset. What would you tell them to, to help them with that raise and that sponsor? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I do get that all the time. And what I tell people, I, I, I want you to I want you to put yourself in the investor's shoes. All right. So now be you're the spot. And we do this when we set our terms all the time. I say, all right, wait a minute. I'm not the sponsor now. I'm going to be the investor. And I'm going to look objectively at considering investing with someone. What's going to matter to me? So I, I'm going to want to have, I want, I want to know that the sponsor is going to have some skin in the game. I'm going to want to know that there's some experience somewhere there, right? Cause you got to have some experience and typically what, well, let me just keep going. I, I, I follow, I want, I want to follow the four rules that I just laid out. Right. So now if I, so let's pretend like I'm a sponsor now that I'm missing one of those things that investors really kind of want, maybe it's experience. We'll go find it. You know, we have partnered with people to be that experience, right? Um, in fact, we closed recently on a deal where it was the guy's first deal. And I said, look, it's, it's kind of small for us. We really wouldn't normally do this deal. I want to help you get started. So you go do your thing. I'll be the experience. I, I like the deal, right? Obviously, I like the deal. And he was able to use our experience because we had some money in the deal as well to give his investors comfort that there's someone there that if something starts to get squirrely, there's an experienced person there. So I would say as a sponsor, you want to figure out what you're missing and try to fill that gap somehow. So that might mean early on that you're giving up a little bit of your promote when you wish you didn't have to. But the alternative is you don't get started, right? And so I, I view it as, um, you know, and, and partner with the people that are going to treat you fairly. All right. Don't, don't let a, a sponsor or a co GP really take you for a ride because some probably will. Right. But you know, you want them to come from a good place. They want to help you get started. 
and there's a lot of guys that that want to help people get started. We we I am like that. I want to help people get started because I know how hard it was in the beginning for me. So you just got to fill that gap, whatever you think you're missing. If you don't have much money, okay, well, my investors want us to have some skin in the game. So maybe if we between my partner or two partners or three partners, we can get you know a meaningful amount. Maybe between us, we can put a hundred thousand in the deal. See, that's significant. Now, as an investor, I'm like, hey. These guys are right next to me. They probably don't want to lose their hundred grand, just like I don't want to lose mine. So you know, you're just trying to solve each one of those problems. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I was hoping you would respond with that. I was kind of throwing the ball up there for an alley oop, and it goes back to the networking that we talked about. Yeah, it does. you find a partner that fills that gap. I always think of commercial real estate acquisitions as putting together a puzzle. It and is. There's different puzzle pieces. Some pieces are bigger than others. But you're going to have to find all those different pieces to get that end finished puzzle finished, which is that closing day, which feels great. It's kind of a similar feeling of finishing the puzzle and signing those mm-hmm. papers after you've been working on it for a while. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm curious, what is the difference between raising for a syndication and raising for a fund? I, I mentioned being on my second syndication now, and I've explored the, the world of funds a little bit, but I haven't actively been involved myself. How is that conversation different with these passive investors? Yeah. So in a syndication, remember, you've gone and found the deal. And now you're talking to your investors, potential investors about that deal. You've got the underwriting there to show them. You've got the rent comps to show them. You've got pictures of the property to show them. They get to sort of assess and underwrite the deal right alongside you. They have that ability. In the fund world, they don't have that ability. In the fund world, it's a blind pool fund. There's a reason the word blind is in that in that title. It's because they make a commitment to us that we're going to buy a certain type of deal. And we would never breach that agreement. We buy BC class value add deals in good neighborhoods in growing communities. That's what we do that we know that we're going to be able to add value to that is our that is our business model. That has always been our business model. And you can go to Veravest and see that we've done it 18 times, right? So so now as a fund manager, when I'm talking to an investor, they don't know which deal is going to be in the fund yet. I don't know which deal is going to be in the fund yet, but they do know that they they buy into the concept. They buy into us as a firm and our ability to be conservative and prudent with their money. And that's the biggest difference. So being early in your career, it's going to be really hard to raise money as a fund manager because you're asking someone to basically give you a blank check And you don't have much for them to go on, right? They're really taking a leap of faith. In our world, we've been doing it for 25 years. We've done the same thing over and over again. We've done it 18 times. We've got good results. Now, there's no guarantees, right? We can't guarantee anything for anybody. But you can see that when you weigh those two groups against each other, one clearly has an advantage over the other. And so that's the biggest difference right there. So I would encourage you at this point in your career to stick to the syndications because people will want to scrutinize all the things that you're scrutinizing right alongside you. It's a great explanation. And I find a lot of the times the investors are just excited to to see that building, especially if they can drive by it and it's local. It's something Mm -hmm. that's physical that they're investing in besides a stock through a broker. And they, they like that ability to drive by it and get updates on what the inside looks like. And that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. What I'm wondering is you mentioned going through that process 18 times and these are value add deals. What does your renovation process look like? Yeah, so I've <laughs> it's a little unusual. It's not what you expect it to be. Um, the first thing that I tell people uh, when they're looking at a renovation is I want you to, um, well, let me see. The first three things I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to talk about five things. I'll be brief, but the first three things have nothing to do with renovation. The first thing I want you to do is make sure you do an in-depth market study to understand where your property is now and where you're going to take it. So you're going to look at the properties that you compete with now, and you're going to look at the next level up, and you're going to understand exactly what your rents are now and what they can be. So that when you talk to an investor about where your rents are, where you're going with your rents, it's you never use the word, I think I can get this. You will show them evidence that will lead you to believe that you are really sure you can get this, right? So you have to have a lot of conviction. Only way to do that is with the market study. The second thing I want you to do is develop a renovation budget. 
and I want you to be prepared to modify it. So many times people, the very first budget they do, they think they can't change it because they're afraid their investors will think they don't know what they're doing. We modify our budgets constantly because that is the prudent thing to do because you're going to learn new information all the time. And, you know, if the world changes you, and that means you should do something differently, don't get stuck. Don't dig in on a business plan that maybe doesn't make sense anymore because you're afraid someone else will think that you're, you, were, you were mistaken on the way in. Now, here's the hardest part about my little project here. And this is, I want you to wait some period of time after you buy it to start your renovation. Most people want to dive in and get it done right away. Now, some things that's okay, but you're going to learn things about that property that you didn't previously know. And wouldn't it be a shame if you implemented your renovation budget, you spent all your money only to find out, oh, oh, I didn't know this about this property. I have a roof that's bad that I didn't know was bad. And now I got no money left to fix it. So I like people to just sit on their hands for 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, right? Whatever it, whatever it takes for you to get really comfortable that your budget is good to go when there's no skeletons at that property that you haven't found yet, because you will find some. Now we get to the renovation. I want you to renovate from the outside in, right? Don't do it from the inside out. Some people think people live in the apartment. You should make the apartment super nice. But if the leasing people can't get those people to the front door because the outside looks bad, you wasted all your money. And I've seen people do this. So make sure your renovation budget follows outside in exteriors, then do interiors. Super important. And then finally, I already mentioned this, but just constantly reassess your plan. I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times our third party management clients have said to me, I'm doing this because that is what I told my investors I would do. And I say to them, but it doesn't make sense that you should do that now. But I, I told my investors I would do that and I'm not going to tell them one thing and do another. I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of negotiating with them here. I'm like, are you sure? Because it really doesn't make sense anymore. And I doubt they would want you to do that if they really understood that the world was different than you thought it was. So anyway, constantly, constantly reassess. We, we do it five, six, seven, eight times on a project. And that's okay. The plan has to be dynamic. So I really like go. that answer. That's, that's going to be another uh, a clip there. That and the, what was the first one? Four points? The Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Four the, ways, four rules for four betting. Four ways to vet and, and yeah, five yeah. points Yeah, if you go to our YouTube channel, you might find something on that topic. You just might. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good stuff there. I, I like a lot of that. And the, the waiting, too, that's such a good point. Because you get so excited and you have this plan and you want to implement it. But there are going to be things that you find out that you didn't know going into it. That you just... you. You won't know unless you're operating the asset. It happened to me a long time ago. See, these are lessons that you learned a long, long time ago. So do you know who funded that improvement that I didn't have the money for? I'm guessing you. Me. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is no way I'm going to ask my partners for that money. Absolutely. Yep. Well, I think we could keep going for another hour here. There's so much good stuff to talk about, but I want to respect your time and wrap this episode up. They say that you have to have three of something to have a collection. So we have a collection of questions for you to wrap up the episode. Okay. The first one, in five words or less, what's the most important thing you've learned since you started collecting real estate? Constantly keep learning. That's great. Bill and I often say constant and never ending improvement. Exact same thing. Yeah, you have to. I've been every at day. It 25 years and I'm learning every single day. Put the ball one yard down the field every single day. Yep. Second question, what are your one to two year personal goals outside of real estate? Outside of real estate is to continue to uh, spend more time with my family. Yeah, I'm Good always answer. been about my family. I mean, you told my, my story starts out with my daughter. Uh, my family's always been super important to me. And so I just want to continue to spend more and more time with my family because that's what life's all about. Yeah, I, I love real estate. I can't imagine doing anything else. But at the end of the day, it's just a means to provide and spend time with family. Absolutely. Third question, where can the listeners find you? How can they contact you? And how can they support you? Sure. So uh, I, I have a little book that I wrote. It's uh, called Multifamily there is a Real book. Estate. Pardon me? There is a book. There is a book. It's actually okay. not on the topics that you think, though. This one, so I've talked to so many new people about getting into this business. It's, the book is Multifamily Real Estate's a Total Game Changer. You go to KRI Properties. No, no, sorry. 
kripartners.com slash ebook. It's not hard to remember. kripartners.com slash ebook. I cover two topics. The first is everybody knows there's a ton of money to be made in real estate. What everybody is trying to figure out is how does it fit into their life? That's re- the number one question that every single person faces. So I spend the first half of the book talking about that, helping them understand their life, put it in perspective. You know, what, uh, uh, you know, what kind of real estate should you invest in based on your risk tolerance? So we go through all that. Most people should be passive investors. They just do because they have so much going on in their life. So the second half of the book does hit on a topic that we've talked a lot about. And that is, I get it's, it's about how to vet sponsors. So now that you know you want to be a passive investor, who do you invest with, right? It's kind of the Wild West out there. And I, I, I don't lay out the rules quite the way I just did on this podcast, but I, talk, I give you some insight as to how our industry works because I always feel like the more an investor is informed, they're in a better position to spot things that don't seem right, right? You know, if you understand how our business works, why we do what we do, how, why people in this business act the way they act, it helps you understand people as an investor and you can spot people that maybe aren't putting you first, things like that. So I've, I'm super passionate about this topic, uh, kripartners.com slash ebook. That's the best way to get in touch with me. You have to do, you have to give me your email and your name. That's it. And then you're in our system and, you know, hopefully we can continue to, to develop the relationship with you. Well, I'm definitely going to take a look at that right after, right after we finish recording here. Ken, Fantastic. thank you for being on the show. We might have to have you back on because there's, there's a lot of good stuff that you're doing and, and I want to learn some more from you. I think you have a lot to share. Well, thanks. I appreciate uh, you having me on. I've really enjoyed this and uh, yeah, I'd love to come back. Thank you.